The Senator from New Jersey. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I, I want to start off by uh, saying how much I agree uh, with uh, my distinguished colleague from Maine. Uh, I think that the LIHEAP program is one that is essential. Uh, there is a real possibility if we do not uh, deal with the LIHEAP program that fellow Americans across the landscape of this country will find themselves uh, in the cold, literally and figuratively, and that they will be in such a situation where they will have to make desperate choices in their lives. And so this is something, among other things, that we should be reaching across the aisle. And as one Democratic senator, uh, I want the senator from Maine to know that we are absolutely in agreement with her. And we believe this is essential to move forward. I appreciate her comments about coming uh, to common ground and common cause on those things that, in fact, we can agree on. And there is much, at least from listening to the speeches on the floor, that, in fact, we supposedly can agree on. We uh, see that there is uh, elements of the Republican package that deal with market speculation. Well, that's the very essence of the underlying bill we're debating. Let's come together on that. Let's come together on the renewable energy tax credits extenders something that we began, that existed, we need to extend if we want to get the marketplace so we're not even depending upon oil, whether it be foreign or domestic. Let's agree upon that. That's something we supposedly both agree on from the speeches I've heard. We should come together in that respect. I've heard about conservation. Use less. We agree on that. Let's come together on that. So I agree with the Senator from Maine that while there may be differences, there's a lot of elements here together that we do agree on. And if we could begin to move on those things, maybe we could come to a point in which we could move forward on other items as well. But why not allow those things that ultimately can make a difference in the short term and in the long term for our collective constituents? When you are cold, it doesn't have a Republican or Democratic label to it. When you have to make a choice between a gallon of gas or putting a gallon of milk on the table, it doesn't have a Democratic or Republican label on it. So I agree with the Senator from Maine, and I'm glad to have been on the floor to listen to her. She is a voice of reason, and I appreciate where she stands on these issues, and I agree with her. And hopefully we can move in that direction. Now, Mr. President, I've come to this floor uh, various times uh, over the last uh, couple weeks uh, to discuss opening up our coastline to drilling. And uh, this is part of one of the marvelous beaches in New Jersey. You have to get off of the New Jersey Turnpike to understand. I've had some colleagues say, why are you so fixated on this drilling issue? You know, isn't your state, uh, you know, one big refining place? And they obviously never got off the New Jersey Turnpike. If you get off the New Jersey Turnpike, you'll see one of the most incredible parts of the United States coastline, where not only do uh, millions of New Jerseyans go to, which they consider it a birthright, but people from throughout the region, Canadians come down and contribute to our economy because they want to go to the New Jersey shore. And the presiding officer, who is uh, the distinguished senior senator from Florida, understands what that Florida coastline means to his state and his economy. And that's why he's been such a vigorous voice on the floor of the Senate. But ever since uh, I've been having to come down to the floor, uh, ever since we've had these two oil men in the White House, the presidential candidate they support, and many uh, on the other side of the aisle, not all, but many on the other side of the aisle, who have begun a very hard sell to the American people of an absurd notion that opening up our coastline to drilling will ever lower gas prices. They have grabbed on to a source of fear and frustration among American families, and there's no question that there is frustration and pain for American families, but they're using that frustration and pain to pull a fast one on the American people. 
exploitation of pain at the pump to grab more land to build up stock prices. That's what this is all about. They are using it to sell a plan that in reality will bring absolutely zero relief to Americans, but instead represents one last great big handout to oil companies that are already making astronomical, staggering record profits. We just saw the beginning of that parade. Uh, Conical Phillips, I think. Conical Phillips. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible increase in the profits. On one hand, you have American families who are getting absolutely slammed by high gas prices. On the other hand, you have oil companies counting their money, sitting on 68 million acres of public land that aren't being put to use and focusing way more on taking that money and using it on stock buybacks that ultimately drive up the value of their shares than exploration or innovation. And Mr. President, it's not because I say that. Listen, listen to what the president of the American Petroleum Institute said when he was saying, well, why can't you create you know, more production? Well, he said, well, we don't have the infrastructure and the rigs and the drills and all the pipeline and everything that is necessary to create more production. Now, he didn't say why. One of the reasons why is they haven't been investing the money to do that. So all the suggestion that lift the moratorium tomorrow, boy, outspreads, sprouts oil and therefore gasoline and prices plunge down. Simply not true. They can't even pursue the 68 million acres, the extra area in the Gulf, the extra area off the outer continental shelf in Alaska that isn't subject to any moratorium right now. They can't even do that and haven't done it. What an incredible falsehood perpetuated on the American people. But the American people, I believe, know better. And so, what, uh, so, so if we listen to these, you'd think that I've seen some of my colleagues shake the legislation say, there's no oil in here. Well, guess what? There's no oil in their proposals either. That's really laughable. Really laughable. Now, what do our colleagues on the other uh, side of the aisle do choose to help? Who do they choose to help? Well, the oil companies have more money than the eye can see. And you don't even hear them talk hear them talk about the oil companies. They never invoke their name unless it's to say, oh, we need to give them more. We need to do more for them. We need to do everything for them. I, I, I just wish I was in the, the average American wishes that they were in the role of the oil companies. Record profits, huge amounts of money. Let's give them more. Let's give them more. They never hear from our Republican friends talking about the oil companies having any responsibility. I'm not saying the responsibility, any responsibility for some of our lack of production. And I just hear one too many speeches that are apologists for the oil companies. Well, multi-billion dollar profits, I'm not going to be an apologist for the oil company. So as we try to pass legislation to crack down on greedy oil speculation, which could lower gas prices quicker than anything, they just say no, even though they include it as part of their proposals. Now, you know, back at home, what, uh, people who are hearing these debates and say, well, you know, they keep talking about speculation. I know what speculation generally means, but what does it mean in the context to the average person? Well, what it means is that traders buy huge quantities of oil online many times intentionally inflating prices. They then turn around and sell those very orders to other traders at even higher prices. And these traders never intend to use the oil. This is not a purchase of oil because they're going to ultimately use it in distribution in the country and make sure that people have, for example, home heating oil or they're going to refine it and have gasoline. No, they use these constant trades bidding up the price 
so they can ultimately cash in. But who gets stuck with the bill every time we have to pay to fill our tanks and heat our homes? It's the American consumer. We Democrats want to do something about it. Now, for those who keep saying, oh, even though it's part of their plan, oh, no, oh, no, this is really not a problem. Well, <laughs> Mr. President, let me read to you from an article that appeared today, July 25th, New York Times. Firm said to manipulate oil market. Commodity regulators in Washington have accused a Dutch trading company of making roughly a million dollars in illegal profits by manipulating the prices of crude oil, heating oil, what we're going to be using this winter, and gasoline over what period of time? An 11-day period of time. A million dollars in 11 days in illegal profits. Oh, it's not a problem. Speculation is not a problem. In audio tapes uncovered in their investigation, I'm continuing to read, Mr. President, from the Times article, regulators said one defendant descri described the scheme as an effort to, quote, bully the market. Bully the market. By making a large number of trades at or near the end of the trading day to move closing prices. Oh, but this is a marketplace that can't be bullied. Therefore, we don't need to do anything about the speculative nature and unbridled speculation. Well, guess what? Million dollars in 11 days with their own voices saying this is an effort to, quote, bully the market. Now, moreover, unlike many manipulation cases, this one the, accuses the defendants of actually succeeding in moving prices that were used as benchmarks for consumer markets. Actually moving the benchmarks that are used for consumer markets. In essence, saying not only is it our intention to bully the market, the regulators are saying yes, and they did bully the markets. They did bully the markets. Now, that complaint that was filed in the Federal District Court in Manhattan says that at least two of those attempts resulted in, guess what, Mr. President? Higher prices for gasoline and crude oil. But our Republicans' friends say, oh no, market manipulation and speculation isn't a problem. Here's just one example. And this has been a reluctant regulator to pursue this. When they've heard the speeches on the floor and they've heard this going on for some time now, all of a sudden we grab one of these companies, 11 days, a million dollars, bullying the market and doing it successfully. That's why we need the legislation that Senator Reid and the Democratic majority brought to the floor and that others talk about saying, is part of our package, well, join us. Join us before more market speculation takes place. What are Democrats trying to do about it? Well, we're trying to add 100 new cops on the beat to the commission that oversees these traders. We're having, trying to create greater transparency for the first time, require, first time requiring detailed reporting of previous unclosed the, the trades and oversight, spot, stopping speculators from inflating oil prices by playing domestic and foreign markets off of each other. As a matter of fact, Mr. President, we had testimony before the Congress, sworn testimony as a matter of fact, not often that we have sworn testimony, by oil companies' executives when they were challenged, well, what's, why are we having these high prices? You tell us that, in fact, the demand and the supply side, we've heard a lot of talk here about supply and demand, well, that largely over the last two years they've traced each other pretty close together. Well then, what's the issue? And what's their response, the very oil companies' executives? Their response is market speculation. Oh, but no, we don't have to go after that. It's not one of the most important issues. It's something that can be done now. So they just say no. 
Now, you know, Mr. President, I've got to hand it to my colleagues for their political talent to use an issue so vital to the daily lives of Americans, convince them that you want to do something about it with a proposal that is more about oil company stock prices than gas prices. That's quite a feat if you can pull it off. That's talent. But here's the problem. The facts always come out, and the facts ultimately always win. So it's been tremendously important to me, at least, as a senator from New Jersey, uh, to come down here and give the facts about coastline drilling. And it's not just the facts about drilling and gas prices, although that's how they initially make their plan popular. It's also the facts about oil spills, which they say are virtually impossible with today's drilling technology. Virtually impossible. Well, that's exactly what they told us about the tanker industry that carries the oil. You know, we don't have any rigs that I, I know of in the country, in, in the coastal waters of the United States where there is drilling, that uh, either doesn't have a pipeline system or doesn't ultimately have a vessel. And we were told we, we have, don't worry about our tanker system. In fact, it is impossible uh, to have any spills. Well, Mr. President, this is what happened with that impossibility uh, where workers uh, are there cleaning up uh, after the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Prince William Sound. Uh, a lot of oil there. Obviously, a huge disaster. Uh, so, if we could say that, and if it was true, that would sure be nice for the eastern and western coastlines of the United States, if it were true that, in fact, it's virtually impossible to have no spills. That sure would be nice for the $200 billion that our coasts generate each and every year in fishing and tourism revenues, $200 billion dollars. And it sure would be nice if it were true for my home state of New Jersey and the millions of people who end up uh, on the Jersey Shore each summer and the half a million jobs just in the state of New Jersey supported by the economy there between recreation tourism and the commercial fishermen and the recreational fishermen. It sure would be nice if an oil spill off the coast of Virginia didn't have the potential to affect the coastline from South Carolina up to New York. That sure would be nice if it were true. But the facts, Mr. President, always come out. And at the end of the day, the facts always win. Now, earlier this month, the distinguished minority leader made this statement, echoed by several of his colleagues as part of their hard sell to the American people, and I quote, not a drop of oil was spilled during Katrina. Not a drop of oil. Well, that sure would be nice if it was true. But the fact of the matter is, is that we see here a photo from the U.S. Coast Guard that was published in the Washington Post uh, on July 14th of 08, and it is, shows us what was happening with the spills and how they were trying to burn those spills up in order to try to deal with a disaster. But not a drop of oil was spilled during Katrina. I guess this picture must be a fabrication of the Coast Guard. Last month, Senator McCain said, and I quote, not even hurricanes Katrina and Rita could cause significant spillage. Well, it's the same picture, Mr. President, by the U.S. Coast Guard. That sure would be nice if it were true. Last time I checked, 7.7 .7 million gallons of oil is pretty significant, pretty significant. And then 
In the last 24 hours, Mr. President, there was a stroke of poetic justice. Poetic justice. Senator McCain was ready to fly out to an oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico to stage a photo opportunity. He was ready to show how safe it is to drill for and transport oil these days. Nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, he should have known better because the facts always come out and the facts always win. Just as he was set to do this, yesterday there was an accident on the Mississippi near New Orleans in which a freighter rammed a barge and spilled 419,000 gallons of fuel oil. Next thing you know, the McCain photo op was postponed. Seems they realize that it's hard to make the case that oil drilling and oil transportation is completely safe when there are 419,000 gallons of oil floating around washing up on the shore nearby. So, of course now, his representatives are saying it was because of the hurricane that hit the southern tip of Texas yesterday that this event was canceled. And I thought, well, that might be a legitimate reason. But then I checked the National Weather Service forecast. And what did the National Weather Service forecast, which I have right here, Mr. President, satellite images, uh, detailed forecast say? It said, the National Weather Service made the following forecast today for the Louisiana Gulf Coast, partly cloudy, scattered to thunderstorms mainly in the afternoon. Highs in the lower 90s. Southeast winds from 5 to 10 miles per hour. Chance of thunderstorms, 30%. I think the presiding officer has a pretty good sense that this is pretty tame weather conditions for this time of the year. Certainly not hurricane weather. So if you look up irony in the dictionary, I think you'll find uh, possibly uh, that it might describe canceling an oil drilling photo op because a massive nearby oil spill took place. Having to cancel your big oil drilling photo because of the massive oil spike is like canceling a crime safety photo op because the house next door just got robbed. In selling this absurd coastline drilling plan to the American people, Senator McCain and others have time and time again pointed to advanced technology that would supposedly eliminate the threat of massive oil spills. Well, this is the oil fire after Katrina. As you can now personally attest to, even with the most modern technology, we can prevent massive oil spills like the one currently devastating the Mississippi just as we couldn't prevent 7.7 .7 million gallons of oil spills after hurricanes Katrina and Rita. And that's the type of straight talk we need about oil drilling and the type of talk the American people need to hear and that they deserve. Whether it's the claim that coastline drilling will lower gas prices, which we know it simply won't. I mean, not only is it clear that when there are millions of acres already subject to oil exploration that aren't being pursued, when in fact the American Petroleum Institute president says, well, we don't have the infrastructure and the drigs and the rills to pursue it. We just, we just can't do that overnight. When in fact we know that we have reduced 800,000 barrels a day in demand because of high gas prices, and when the Saudis have produced 500,000 barrels a day in extra production, a 1.3 million barrels a day shift in barrels of oil, and gas prices have done what, Mr. President? They've gone up. We opened up the Gulf, 181, gas prices has gone up. So, if 1.3 million barrels of either re reduced demand or increased production haven't done anything about gas prices, imagine the very large sum of 200,000 barrels in the year 2030 at this risk. 
If 1.3 million can't do it, how does 200,000 do it and yet accept this risk? Accept this risk to this environment and to the $200 billion that is generated by the coasts of the East and West. And by the way, that 200,000 would mean that every state would have to agree, assuming we give states an opt-in, and we've already heard the governor of California say, no way, one of the biggest parts of the coastline. That you get Oregon and Washington in that respect. We've heard some of their, our distinguished colleagues say that that's not going to happen. You know, New Jersey won't do it. So by the time you're finished, you're nowhere near even the 200,000. False, false, false. Now, what is it that we can do? Well, I would hope, following the comments of the distinguished senator from Maine, who said, let us do what is possible and we agree to, and that possible and what we agree to is very significant. Republicans say they offer renewable energy sources and for providing the tax credits that existed and expired and should be brought back to life. They say that they're for that. Well, you've said no twice, though. Twice we've brought that forward, and you've said no twice. And the fact is that passing the tax credit extenders would create the incentives that are necessary to move us in a direction in which oil is not the issue and risking the coastlines and the 200 billion economy is not the issue and we can do things in a tighter tight frame and better tight frame than the year 2030 that would move us towards renewable energy sources like wind and solar and biomass and cellulosic ethanol plug-in hybrids which are critical and all of these things would move us in the direction far beyond far before before 2030, which is when the, all of this production would take place, if it takes place. Now, we supposedly agree on that. Let's move forward on that. But our Republican friends have said no twice. Republicans say that speculation is part of their package. I talked about that earlier. So we saw already one company being pursued, million dollars, 11 days, bully the market, succeeded doing it. Well it's time to move on speculation. And yet, that's the very essence of the underlying bill. Can't seem to get them to agree on that. And most of the speeches I've been hearing is that they poo-poo speculation. Well, when it made a difference in oil and gas prices, as that case suggests, I would simply say that is certainly not anything to be poo-pooed. It's real and it's consequential and even the testimony of the oil company's executives say it could produce anywhere up, up to $50 per barrel more. Republicans say that conservation is part of their package. We agree. So why not join us in that respect as well with the conservation proposals that we have put forward? So there's three very significant areas, renewable energy tax credits, speculation, conservation. Let's move forward. But instead, what we have is a series of no's. Then we have 18 amendments, Mr. President, filed by Republicans, all to do what? To open the coastline of our country, which I've already discussed will not achieve anything. But you need 18 different amendments, even to pursue what you think is a appropriate energy policy to open up the coastline to drilling to risk the consequences of this? Okay. Well, the majority leader said, go ahead. We'll give you an amendment. We'll give you an amendment. But you can't take yes for an answer. We have to have 18 different amendments to do the virtually the same thing. So, Mr. President, you can repeat a big lie over and over again. We have seen that in the history of the world. That you can take something that is not quite true, repeat it over and over again, and try to give it the life uh, that it otherwise doesn't deserve. Try to make it true. But saying it over and over again doesn't make it true. Saying over and over again that drilling is the panacea, the solution, bring down gas prices, you know, the way I hear it, I hear pass the legislation, have the president sign it tomorrow, oil sprouts up, gas gets made, Prices go down. 
I give a lot more credit to the American people uh, than that. The truth, crushed down to the floor, springs back up. And the truth is, the truth is, that in fact, we have the wherewithal to move our country in a much different direction. It is the can-do spirit of America. It is the pioneer spirit of America. It is a spirit that gets going and gets going, the tough get going when, the, when it is going rough. And that is the spirit, in fact, that we have. That is the spirit we should pursue. That's the renewable energy tax credits. That's the conservation. That's stopping the speculation in the marketplace. That is ensuring that, in fact, we move to these renewable energy sources. That makes for a great America new economies and do something uh, about global warming all at the same time that we deal with the challenges of gas prices in the short term and liberate ourselves in the long term. Mr. President, that's President, what the debate is all about. So. Will the Senator yield for a question? I'd be happy to yield. Uh, the Senator has given an excellent exposition uh, and debunks a number of these myths. And I just wanted to ask the Senator in his recitation of debunking the statements made by a number of senators on this floor that there was no spill, no oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico after Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita. I wanted to ask the senator if he had seen this particular report from the White House. The White House itself, the federal response to Hurricane Katrina, lessons learned February of 06 after Katrina in August of 05, and listen to what this report, I want to find out if the senator had seen this report, quote, in fact, Hurricane Katrina caused at least 10 oil spills releasing the same quantity of oil as some of the worst oil spills in U.S. history. Louisiana reported at least six major spills of over 100,000 gallons and four medium spills of over 10,000 gallons. All told, more than 7.4 million gallons poured into the Gulf Coast region's waterways over two-thirds of the amount that spilled out during America's worst oil disaster, the rupturing of the Exxon Valdez tanker off the Alaskan coast in 1989. End of quote from the very report on Katrina from the White House. Has the senator seen that report? I, I have, and I, I appreciate the distinguished uh, senator from uh, Florida pointing it out, and uh, the words are powerful because it's not a member of the Senate saying this, not a Democrat saying this. Uh, this is the official report. Uh, I've used the pictures because the picture speaks towards a thousand words, and you cannot deny it. You cannot deny it, as you cannot deny the report. The fact of the matter is that we had massive oil spills after Katrina and Rita. Coast Guard picture, that's the reality. Fact of the matter is, we were told we have the most highly technological advance impossible to have any spills as a result of tankers, Exxon Valdez. So uh, it simply is not true to suggest that there was not, how is it that uh, it's been quoted here? Not even hurricanes Katrina and Rita could cause significant spillage. Or, this is even, at least that says significant spillage, not a drop of oil was spilled during Katrina. Pretty tough. Pretty tough to say that not a drop of oil was spilled during Katrina. And this is why we have to be uh, so cautious uh, about risking the coastlines, the economies, the environment, when it won't produce a drop of oil for over a decade, won't do anything about gas prices now or in the future, 
but can create an enormous consequence. We need to be honest with the American people, and I hope that uh, this opportunity to get to the floor and talk about some of these facts and show some of the photos of the Coast Guard make it very clear. And with that, Mr. President, I, I yield the floor. <coughs>